the car in front of me had a bumper sticker that said, life is the pits. Now, as a Christian that has received Jesus Christ into his life, I've found that God gives a wonderful, abundant life, so I don't agree with that statement, life is the pits. But at the same time, I dare not sugarcoat my faith and try to pretend that there aren't pits in life because there's lots of them. And you've experienced them. Some of you are in a pit right now. Some of you have been in the pits in the past. Some of you will be in the pits in the future. And if you were to think a little bit, your emotions could go back to some hard times. In 2001, my mom and dad, Leroy and Elaine Shevlin, moved to Florida. And I went down with my brother to help pack them up, and off they went. When they got into Georgia, my dad, due to either low blood pressure or maybe the length of the trip, fell asleep at the wheel. And suddenly my mom shouted out Leroy as he started going off the road, and he woke up, overcompensated, and the car went spinning into the ditch. My dad was immediately killed. My mom had such serious injuries that she was flown to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and there she was in intensive care, and my siblings uh, and myself all found quick transportation uh, and zoomed down there to be with her. Just like that. We were thrown into a very deep, very dark, dismal pit. My mom just died a year ago now. We're all going to go through trials. The beauty of being a follower of Jesus Christ is even though we experience the pain and the tribulation, God goes through those trials holding us in his arms right there with us. And he gives us some principles that really help. And there's a psalm out of the book of Psalms that was of incredible help to me during those trials and during other trials. And that psalm is Psalm 40. I'd love for you to turn there right now. It's a passage that shows us how to get out of the mire and into the choir. Got a little visual back here that sort of shows the blackness of a deep, miry pit and the rock of stability that's next to it. Picture that as you follow along as I read the first four verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. If you can, try to get into the emotion of David. He's speaking metaphorically here, and he emotionally he feels like he's down here at the bottom of a dark, slimy, miry pit. It is so dark and so deep that he can't get out of it. He's reaching on up with his hands. He's clawing at the side. He's trying to climb out, but it's just too wet. And down he slides again and again and again, and he feels like he's in despair. What was it that was causing this in his life? Well, we really don't know. If you are to look at the chronology of David's life, it could have been one of many trials. It could have been the threat of his many enemies. In Psalm 69, he cries out, Save me, O God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful. Or his pit could have been following his great sin with Bathsheba and the slaying of her husband, a time in which he is filled with awesome guilt when he realized exactly how much he had sinned against God. He says in Psalm 51, Be gracious to me, O God, 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Or it may have been during a time of pain and disease like you find in Psalm 30. It could have been these pits. It could have been other pits. All we know is that he generalizes it, and I think he does it as for a purpose, and that is so that we can apply this to whatever trial that we're going through. And in this room, there are a lot of them. If we were to go down the pews one by one, each of you can tell about the hurts that you've gone through or maybe are going through right now. A pit could be the breaking point for someone who's overworked at their job. They're working 10, 12 hours a day in a low-paying job, never seeming to get ahead, and the trial just keeps going on and going on. A pit could be the loneliness of a grieving widow who so misses her husband. A pit could be coming to that difficult limit with a young mother at home with small children and feeling so exhausted under the constant strain. A pit could be a student in school living with impossible expectations placed on him with all the classes and with the hopes of getting into college. A pit could be a relationship problem. When you're in a difficult emotional social relationship with others and you just feel conflict between you and them, a pit could be the physical reoccurring pain of someone that's wrestling with some physical hardship. A pit could be the constant strains of not having enough money. A pit could be the pain of being in a loveless marriage. Or maybe like a man that I talked to yesterday who even though he was divorced a few years ago, is still feeling the daily consequences and pain from that difficult time in his life. A pit could be all of these things, or it could be so many more. What pit have you gone through? What pit are you in right now? You scratch, you claw, you try to get out, and down you slide. That's how David felt. And that's how you may feel. What do you do when you're stuck in the muck? We're going to look at two questions this morning. First one is this. How do you get out of the mire? And the second one is how do you get into the choir? Uh, for those of you who don't care for Choirs, you just change the title of this message. How do you get out of the goop and into the group? <laughs> the message is the same. But it starts with this How do you get out of the mire? And I'm going to make this really simple so that you remember it and you can hold on to it. You call out to God in faith and you wait for his deliverance. It's as simple as that. But we're going to expand on it. I want you to say it with me, though. It's on the screen. Call out to God in faith and wait for his deliverance. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And he lifted me up out of that horrible pit out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. I know that it's new NIV on the screen. But I've memorized that the King James Version. It says the same thing, but the message, I'd encourage you to memorize in the version of your choice, and hold on to it. Hold on to it. You call out to God in faith and you wait for his deliverance. Here's the deal. God never, ever promised us that we wouldn't have trials. In fact, he promised us that we would. His words in the New Testament is, in this world you will have tribulation. But along with the presence of trials, he also promises the presence of himself. He says, fear not. I have overcome the world. And right there we learn something very, very wonderful. And that's this, that way too often our difficulty in the pit is magnified by the fact that we keep trying to overcome our trials by ourselves. And we do everything in our own strength and our own willpower and our own self-knowledge to try to take care of those problems. When in this passage, God reveals this, I'm the one that's overcome the world. And he's the only one that can overcome our trials and our tribulations. And so when we are in the pit, what do we do? We call out to the overcomer. We call out to God. 
We don't look to ourselves, nor do we look to other sources, those people that we think are going to help us. No, it might be that God will use others, but they shouldn't be the ones that we go to first. If the first person we call is our doctor rather than the Lord, we've got our priorities all mixed up, as great a doctor as you might have. We need to say, God alone is the one that can come along and help me, and he can use any supply source that he chooses to use. Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9 says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. When you find yourself in the pit, don't cry out to just anybody. Cry out to God. In verses 11 through 17, if you were to follow this passage through and study it in great detail, here you'll find a model prayer of something that David prayed while he was in this pit. He says, Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you and rejoice Seek you, rejoice, and be glad in you. And may they who love your salvation always say, The Lord be exalted. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help, and you are my deliverer, O Lord. And then he says one more thing, which you can surely pray, and that is, Oh my God, do not delay. But the problem is, Sometimes God does delay. Have you noticed that? You go through those times of hurt and pain, and you say, okay, Lord, I think I've learned all the lessons you want me to learn. So you can pull me out of the pit right now. And there you sit. And you sit, and you sit, and you sit, and you wonder, why would an almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God not yank me out of this pit before now. Why? You call out to God in faith and you wait for his deliverance. God will deliver us. But not always immediately. The Lord is eager, but he's not always hasty. In the Hebrew, this phrase, I waited for the Lord, could be translated, waiting I waited. It's got that type of stress placed upon it. And you have to say, why? I believe that there are many reasons given in Scripture. I'd like to suggest just two of the most common. And they are these. One reason is, for your discipline. And the second reason is, for your development. First of all, for your discipline. Sometimes we are in a pit as a consequence of our own sin. And God might be waiting for you to change your direction before he changes your circumstances. That's why whenever you find yourself in a trial, it's always proper to do a personal spiritual checkup and to reach up to God and say, God, is there anything that I need to learn in my life through this? Are there things in my life that aren't pure before you that I need to confess this sin? In Psalm 139, David cries out, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And when we find ourselves in a trial, that's exactly the kind of prayer that you can honestly come before God and pray. Lord, would you search me out? Would you try me? Know my thoughts, know my heart. Would you see if there's any wicked way in me? And as God shows you those things, he does a transformation while you're still in the pit so you can be delivered from it. There's a second reason, that's for your development. It could be that there's no sin involved whatsoever. But God's got some lessons for you. Sometimes our trials are meant to be faith stretchers. And God wants to do a work in your life, and he may develop you in the pit before he delivers you from the pit. In 1993, Gerald Sitzer 
a professor at Whitworth College, was coming home from a family outing. In his car was his wife of 20 years, his mother, and his four children. As they're going down the highway, all of a sudden the headlights of another car swerved and a drunk driver hit them head on and immediately his wife was killed, his mother was killed, and his two-year-old daughter was killed. He describes some of his insights in a book that he wrote called A Grace Disguised. I'd like to quote from that. The accident itself bewilders me today as much as it did three years ago. Much good has come out of it, but all the good in the world will never make the accident itself good. It remains a horrible, tragic, and evil event to me. Yet, the grief that I feel is sweet as well as bitter. I still have a sorrowful soul, yet I wake up each morning joyful, eager for what the new day will bring. Never have I felt as much pain as I have in the last three years, yet never have I experienced as much pleasure in simply being alive. Never have I felt so broken, yet never have I felt so whole. Never have I been so aware of my weaknesses and vulnerability, yet never have I been so content and felt so strong. Above all, I've become aware of the power of God's grace and my need for it. My soul has grown because it has been awakened to the goodness and the love of God. God has been present in my life these past three years, and God will continue to be present to the end of my life and throughout all eternity. God is growing my soul, and he's making it bigger, and he's filling it with himself. My life is being transformed. In this pit, in and of itself, which is an ugly, cruel, terrible thing, God was doing a sweet work in his life and was developing him. He wrote an article for Discipleship Magazine when he went on to say, Jesus charges us to view life from a redemptive perspective. There's more to life than meets the eye when God gets involved. He works things out for good. We view unanswered prayer from the perspective of our immediate experience and our limited vision, but God is doing something so great that only faith can grasp it. Wait for it and pray for it. Here are two key reasons why you might be in that pit for a while. One is discipline, the other one is development. And that's just a sampling. There could be many other reasons. But frankly, there is a little bit of a danger in focusing on those reasons. Because sometimes in my life, and perhaps in yours, I want the security of being able to figure it all out. And if I can figure out the reasons, that gives me my peace and my stability. That should never be the case. We need to the, look to the one who gives the reasons and make him our source of all assurance. When Job was going through all of his trials, he gets to the end of the book and he expects God to explain why he went through all of this. Instead, God simply reveals himself and all of his greatness and he says, now that you can see how great and powerful and wonderful and loving I am, can you just trust me? And that's what God asks us to do. Part of our problem is sometimes always asking why when really we're not in a position to know or understand why God is doing anything in this life to a total measure. It's not enough to wait for an answer. We've got to wait for the Lord. He is the answer. If I find a satisfying answer, I've got a temporary solution. But if I, if I find a quick end to my troubles, I've got temporary relief. But if I trust in God's wisdom, love, and power, I've got an eternal help. We need to wait, and we need to wait patiently for the Lord. Okay, now what does that mean? What does it mean to wait patiently? It doesn't mean sitting there like you're in a bench waiting for your bus, passively wondering when the world God's going to show up. So here I sit. Here I twiddle my thumbs. Here I wonder when is God going to come through with his deliverance. Now literally in the Hebrew, that waiting patiently has also got the mentality 
mentality of waiting intently. That's why some of you got different translations with you in the pews today. We'll find that word instead of the word patiently. Both of them are sort of pulled together. There's an intensity here, an intentionality that says, when I wait, what I'm doing is I am relying upon God. I'm focusing, actively focusing my trust in Him. That means during this time of wait, I'm constantly looking up to God and I'm praying to Him. Lord, I'm praying to you. I'm leaning upon you. I'm, I'm asking you to help me during this trial and I'm help, asking you to, to, to deliver me from this trial. And I'm actively reading your word. And I'm getting the promises and I'm applying them to my life and, and I'm making all this work for me. And I'm spending time in, in, in just relying upon him in this walking conversation with him. I'm leaning upon family members in the body of Christ. There is an intensity of waiting here. It's not neglecting God and just waiting for him to fix the problem. It's actively waiting, actively hoping. I like to say it this way. It's looking up to God with a belief that God is looking out for you. Does that make sense? It's a constant looking up to God with the confidence that God is looking out for you. There's a story, true story of a man who lost his wife and suddenly found himself to be the father and the mother to a six-year-old son. When they came home from the funeral, the two of them were full of such grief and dark despair that it was just hard to enter their home. And when it came time to go to bed that night, a little boy said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, can I, can I sleep in your room tonight? The father said, Sure, son. But they had a hard time sleeping. And while they were lying there, they were both tossing and turning and allowing their grief and their worry to just spin through their hearts. And neither father or son could fall asleep. And they laid there for the longest, longest time until suddenly the little boy turned to his father and in the darkness said, Daddy, are you looking at me? I think I could sleep if I knew that you were looking at me. father says, yes, son, I'm looking at you. And sure enough, the little boy did fall asleep. And the father got out of bed. And he went over to the curtains of his slider. And he slid them open. He looked up at the moon. And he prayed, Father, are you looking at me? I think I could sleep if I knew that you were looking at me. Faith is a constant looking up to God with the confidence of knowing that he's looking out for you. That's what waiting upon the Lord is all about. How long will it take for God to answer your prayers? We never know, do we? We'd like to know. Sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's days, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years. Sometimes it's in this life, sometimes it's in the next life. We don't know how long it's going to be for God to move on your behalf, but we do know this, and you can count on it, God will act in just the right time, in just the right way, God will deliver the person who calls out to him in faith and waits for his deliverance. David calls out, and God delivers him from the slimy pit, and he puts his feet upon a rock, and he establishes his going. Joseph was thrown into a cistern by his brother. The word for cistern in that passage is the very same word for pit in Psalm 40. And God pulls him out of that pit when he could have died there, and he delivered him from the hands of his brothers. In the future days, he is thrown into other emotional pits, but constantly he was delivered, and God had a great ending to his story, a wonderful deliverance. Jeremiah was thrown into a pit. It was a cistern 
that had no water in it. It's thrown there by King Zedekiah. And Jeremiah 38, 6 says, There is no water in the cistern, but only mire. And Jeremiah sank in the mire. And what did Jeremiah do? He waited upon the Lord to act. And act, God did. In Jeremiah's case, God used an official to plead Jeremiah's case before the king. And the king told the official to take 30 men and to pull Jeremiah out of that pit. The greatest pit of all? It was the cross. Jesus Christ was nailed there by his own love for you. And he died a horrible death and he was buried in a cold tomb. And then the resurrection occurred. Talk about being pulled out of a pit. And Jesus Christ came back to life. If Jesus could be raised from the dead, do you not think that you can be raised out of your pit that you're going through? That very same resurrection power is available to you and it's available to you right when God chooses to act. God supernaturally lifts us out of the quagmire, defeat, despair, and desperation, and he places us upon a rock, a rock that represents stability and security. And God wants to put you upon that rock, and he wants to do that deliverance in your life. And when he does, you're going to experience such joy and such happiness, you'll know that God's come through for you. So let's go back to the first question. How do you get out of the mire? You remember? You call out to God in faith and you wait for his deliverance. I think maybe we might need to practice that. You think so? Let's try it. Call out to God in faith and wait for his deliverance. Now, second question is this. How do you get into the choir? And the answer is you sing out to God in praise and you wait for others to join in. Say it. You sing out to God in praise and you wait for others to join in. Verse 3 says, He's put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and put their trust in the Lord. You see, there's a chain reaction here. When you are pulled out of the pit, the result is that you're filled with praise and other people hear your testimony of where you were and where God has now placed you and not only does your faith grow but as they hear you shouting out God's praises for what he's done it grows their faith as well it starts off by singing out to God in praise verse 3 says he hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God this is no new theme for the psalmist you look through the various psalms and you find it over and over again. Verse after verse, it talks about this new song. Psalm 33, 3 says, Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Psalm 96, 1, Sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 98, 1, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Psalm 144, 9, I'll sing unto thee a new song. Psalm 149, 1, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praises in the congregations of his saints. Constantly a new song. And so let me ask you the, the simple theoretical question. Uh, does this emphasis on new songs mean that we have to have contemporary music? <laughs> well, the answer is yes and no. It's both and. Yes, in the sense of our God is a creative God. And being created in his image, we should be creative people. And so we should always be creating new things for his glory. And that includes music and songs and everything else and whatever God has allowed you to be creative in. And uh, this Psalm, Psalm 40, was contemporary music in its day when David wrote it. It was very fresh. It was in the top ten. But you don't have to have new lyrics and a new tune to have a new song. You can take the oldest hymn in the world, and if God does this new spontaneous work in your life where you've got a fresh burst of appreciation for what God has done, you take that song and it's a new song of praise for you. So use the old songs, use the new songs, make one up as you sit. But sing forth God's praises with a fresh new appreciation for who he is and what he's done in your life. And it will be new for you. Sing a new song. And it's easy to do. Why? Because his mercies are new every morning. You've got constant, 
constant new content coming from God for your new songs. God constantly blesses, he constantly delivers, he constantly gives us new things to give him praise for. Verse 5 says, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you've done, the things you've planned for us. No one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, there'd be too many to declare. This is praise, and it's wholehearted praise, and it's by match, by wholehearted commitment, for our praise should always be backed up by lives that are fully devoted to him in every dimension of our lives, with our service, with our behavior, with our giving, with everything. Verse 6 through 8 says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. You've opened up my ears to what you've got to say. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It's written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Even a prophetic passage, it talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also shows how our heart should be in one with his heart so that we should say, God, you've got all of me. You've got my praise. You've got my life. I desire to do your will. I want to go all out for you. When God delivers us from the pit and he puts our feet upon a rock, we recognize it's only been done by his grace and he deserves all the glory. He deserves all the commitment. I love this little poem. He raised me from a horrid pit where morning long I lay, and from my bonds released my feet, deep bonds of miry clay. Firm on a rock he made me stand and taught my cheerful tongue to praise the wonders of his hand in a new thankful song. He went from singing the blues to singing the hallelujah chorus. That's what God does in our lives. We sing out to God in praise, and then we wait for others to join in. Verse 3 says, many will see it in fear and put their trust in the Lord. You see, the purpose of David's public song of praise was, first of all, to give praise to God, but secondly, to give encouragement to others to put their faith in him as well. And testimonials always have that goal in mind. You think even of how marketers will use testimonials. I mean, Here's the guy that's on television. He says, I used Jiffy Clean and it took my dirty clothes and made it white as can be. And you're sitting there watching that television screen. He says, well, if it works for that guy and his dirty clothes, it could work for me. And off you run to the store and you buy yourself some Jiffy Clean. Well, if it works with Jiffy Clean, how much more when you're able to sing the praises of an almighty God and say to the people around you, to the people in the church, to the people in your workplace, to the person living next door to you, I got to tell you what God's done. And you brag about God. I like that word brag. It's an acrostic for me. B-R-A-G. Boast regularly about God. Go big. Go public. Sing God's praises. Your praise can build the faith of others. Verse 9 and 10 says, I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. You get that? He does it in the great assembly. He's going public like we need to do. I do not seal my lips as you know, O Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Listen, you can hide God's word in your heart if you want to, but you don't hide your praise there. You don't whisper it, you shout it. You don't hum it, you sing it. When you go public with your song of deliverance, others hear their faith is grown, and all of a sudden, they start humming along with you and you've turned from a soloist into an ensemble and you turn from an ensemble into a choir, a choir of people who are caught up with the greatness of our Lord God Almighty. That's what happens. Once my family went and saw the musical Annie and we enjoyed it as a family, but it had this contagious effect for the next week. One of us would all of a sudden start humming, humming one of his things and maybe sing a little bit. The rest of us start joining in. The sun will come out tomorrow. You know what? Sing it with me. Bet your bottom dollar it's tomorrow. Come what may. You can see why I'm not the worship leader here. <laughs> but now for the rest of the afternoon, everybody's going to be humming that thing, aren't you? Okay, some of you. Some of you hate it. Uh, but the point is, our songs of praise are contagious. So sing them. Let other people hear them turn the people around you into a choir. The best choir is going to be in heaven. That's where my dad is. He longed for heaven. 
Mom told the rest of his kids when we were in the hospital room that when they were moving down and driving along the highway, they were talking about their new home in Florida and how excited they were to go there. When all of a sudden Dad says, yeah, but you know, that's just going to be a temporary home. That's not our real home. Our real home is going to be in heaven. And then they started singing little hymns about heaven. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And other songs. Little knowing that within that day, Dad would be there. I felt bad a little bit for my dad because he didn't get to go to his home in Florida that he's looking forward to so much. Isn't that sort of silly? That's like feeling sorry for the kid who wants to go to the street carnival and instead gets taken to Disneyland. And so the grief that we felt was only for ourselves, for Dad. He was celebrating. And he was in heaven. And he is seeing the glories of God Almighty. And he was singing his praises. He left his trials, he left his hurts, he left all of his problems behind. And he experienced the full measure of joy. When Jody got a hold of me with the news that my dad had died, I came home immediately. And then my son Luke, who was just eight at the time, got off the school bus and started walking up our long driveway towards me and he had his big heavy backpack on and he threw it on off, not used to seeing me home that early, he threw off his backpack and he ran like crazy into my arms. Makes dad feel good. And uh, then he explained, that backpack was heavy, I knew I couldn't run as fast, I wanted to get to you quick. <laughs> and I said, you know, Luke, that's what your grandpa did today. What do you mean? Today he threw off his backpack and he ran into the arms of the Heavenly Father. See, Grandpa died today. And he's now with God. Luke says, so you mean, like I threw off my backpack, that's sort of like Dad throwing, Grandpa throwing off his, his body so that he could rush right in the arms of God? And I said, you got it. And he did get it. Do we? Dad's in heaven right now singing the heavenly choir. Revelation 5, 6 through 14 says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen. And all God's people said amen. A shrouding blackness engulfs my being. Alone, afraid, my mind a whirlpool ever inwards towards an eternity of intolerable pain. I used to reach a hand into the black unknown and hope that my soul was torn from me 
and I hoped no more. It was like a pit, unfathomable depth, torturous groveling, my tears the only sound in the impenetrable darkness. I remember that pit and the pain and the hopelessness of an eternal agony of mind and the soulless wandering in uncharted desert. Now I find myself at this oasis, this unlooked for harbor, this refuge. I do not deserve that gracious act to pluck me from that all-powerful deep. I had no hope. The turning back along the path I came, I see a gracious hand, a loving smile. I see a guiding light and feel a protecting ring. Nestling in your warmth, my cold heart has thawed. The blackness in my soul has blossomed into a million blooms. My tears have turned to jewels and my bitterness to honey. But I remember the pit. Keep me, O oh Lord, safe in the refuge of your wings.